This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk a little bit more about censoring Bitcoin and Ethereum. I've been getting a lot of questions about OFAC censorship, which I've alluded to in many videos. And it's important to note that we are going to be discussing censor censorship at the protocol level, in other words, at the level of block production. So for example, Bitcoin miners can choose not to include certain transactions in a block, Ethereum validators, which are the equivalent under proof of stake of miners, Ethereum validators can choose not to include certain transactions in a block. And I've been pointing out that since the merge in October of 2022, that's 67%. Well, over the last 30 days, 67% of blocks have been enforcing OFAC compliance over that entire period. Since the merge, uh, we will see how many blocks 60% have been enforcing OFAC compliance. And the reason that they can do this, well, before I discuss that, let's talk about what OFAC is. OFAC stands for the Office of Foreign Assets Control. It's a branch of the U.S. Treasury, and it's the branch that's really focused on administering and enforcing economic san sanctions, trade sanctions, going after terrorist money laundering, for example. And what they did last year in August of 2022 is they sanctioned a smart contract on Ethereum, and they basically said that you're not allowed to touch any Ethereum addresses that are associated with this. And you can see here the list of Ethereum addresses, which you can just plug into any Ethereum block explorer and take a look at. So these were added to any other Ethereum addresses that had already been sanctioned by OFAC. And the reason that censorship is fairly easy to do on Ethereum now is because you have concentration among the staking pool. So we can see here, here's Lido, here is Coinbase, Kraken, Binance, and just those four staking pools gets you to about 50% of the market share. Then you have some other regulated uh, Bitcoin Suisse, for example, other regulated staking pools here. So what is happening is ever since the merge, as we said, a majority of Ethereum validators, or at least a majority of the blocks, have been imposing OFAC censorship on the blocks that they produce. In other words, they've been refusing to package up transactions that may have directly or indirectly touched these flagged Ethereum addresses that we showed you. And why are they doing this? They're doing this because they have to do it because these large staking pools are centralized government regulated entities that can easily be punished by US regulators. How do you punish them? Well, Coinbase is publicly traded in the US. So a lot you can do with publicly traded companies to put pressure on them, either through the SEC or through other channels. Lido, the staking pool, is backed by American venture capitalists, as we're going to see. Binance and Kraken are registered as money services businesses in the US. So when they are validating Ethereum blocks, they can they cannot include any flagged Ethereum addresses or transactions. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and maybe leave a comment or question in the discussion in the uh, comment section below. So we said Lido or Lido is backed by American venture capitalists. We can see here on Crunchbase, Andreessen Horowitz, Dragonfly Capital, even Coinbase Ventures. These are all regulated large US entities. Now, isn't this a problem for Bitcoin as well? Yes, it is. You can definitely still have censorship, as we'll talk about with Bitcoin, but it's not nearly as severe because Bitcoin is proof of work. And doing proof of work is very hard business. Bitcoin mining business is a difficult business, especially to do at scale, because you need to cool your mining machines, which can make large scale operations much more difficult than small scale operations. For example, if you're just heating your home with a Bitcoin miner with an ASIC, it's very easy to dissipate the heat and you welcome the heat. But if you have a large facility in the middle of nowhere and it's summer and you're trying to cool it down, this is where, uh, where uh, the scale doesn't really help you. There are no advantages to having a larger scale. Bitcoin mining machines, in addition, these ASICs, they burn out, they need to be replaced, they may get run at too high of a speed, and then they burn out too soon. So you really have to know what you're doing. You also need to be able to lock in cheap electricity. So as a result of all these industrial challenges, new Bitcoin mining companies are constantly coming and going, and large Bitcoin mining companies go bankrupt every cycle, as we saw in this bear market and cycle as well. In fact, we saw it happen to the largest uh, publicly traded Bitcoin miner in the US, and I believe in, in the world, which was Core Scientific, which filed for bankruptcy back in December of 2022. And as a result, many of their mining machines will now be dumped on the market and sold. Lock, likewise, BlockFi has now just, just been granted approval to sell off some of their assets, which includes some Bitcoin 
mining machines, some ASICs as well. So when these companies mess up, their Bitcoin mining machines go back on the market. Proof of work leads to less centralization than proof of stake, since there's so many ways to mess up proof of, proof of work and go bankrupt. Large companies go bankrupt, and then, as we said, their mining machines are dumped on the market and redistributed around the world at bargain prices. By contrast, proof of stake is really easy to do. You just stake your 32 ETH, assuming you have that much money, and you sit on your hands and you get richer. And a lot of the beneficiaries of the huge Ethereum pre-mine, they got their tokens for free. And so they, now they don't need to do anything else. They can just sit on their hands and get richer and richer. There are no mining machines that you need to replace as with Bitcoin miners. You don't need to be constantly searching for new sources of cheap electricity. And so as a result, proof of stake is really a system of increasing centralization where the rich get richer. Proof of work, by contrast, is you have the rich constantly messing it up through greed and poor risk management practices, as we saw with Core Scientific and BlockFi. And as a result, you end up with much less centralization over time. If you take a look at yesterday, five years ago, the big Bitcoin mining companies, they're not the same as the ones today. Now, what about Bitcoin mining pool centralization? This is something we've talked about in other videos, but it always comes up. You'll see these pie charts that show Foundry and Ant pool and F2 pool controlling whatever you want to say, 75% of the hash rate. And people who cite this as a rebuttal to the concerns about Ethereum's proof of stake, they don't understand what a Bitcoin mining pool is. A Bitcoin mining pool is nothing more than a node service. It really only takes place in cyberspace. Your Bitcoin mining machine, for example, sits in your garage or in your, or in your basement, in your custody, and then you can point its hash to any mining pool in the world. And it's very easy to switch pools in a few seconds if that mining pool tries to do something bad. We saw that this happen to Poolin last year, which stopped paying out some of its profits and immediately it went from having something like 10% of the hash to 1% of the hash as all the Bitcoin miners left that pool. By contrast, when you stake your ETH in an Ethereum staking pool like Lido or Coinbase, they have actual custody of your ETH. It's much more difficult and time consuming to get your ETH back. Right now, it's currently impossible to even unstake your ETH if you were staking it yourself in the protocol because the Ethereum devs haven't made it, haven't made withdrawals available, which tells you a lot about central centralization and the power of Vitalik and the Ethereum foundation. So if a Bitcoin mining pool does some shady business, it's very easy to point your hash, point your machine to another mining pool. If something goes wrong with your staking pool though, you might not be able to get out. If the US government tells Lido or Coinbase not to return your staked ETH to you, what are you gonna do? Or if some other hostile government tells them they have your ETH and they may just decide to keep it, especially if the government says they need to. By contrast, a Bitcoin miner sitting in your basement is much more secure and decentralized. Now, if you wanna go down this rabbit hole a little further, I made this video a few weeks ago about Bitcoin, quote unquote, being controlled by two mining pools. So you can check that out as well as this one in which I argue that we need to all be doing some Bitcoin mining and have these mining machines heating our houses, heating our, our hot water, for example. And in this way, you end up with much more, much more decentralization. Now, if I'm correct that proof of stake leads to more centralization, then you can expect large ETH staking pools like Coinbase and Lido to continue to gain market share as a percentage of the total staking market. And what this means is that OFAC and other censorship will increase for Ethereum at the protocol level simply because stakers get larger and larger over time. The large stakers are always regulated by the uh, by the government or by the regulators, and as a result, they need to impose censorship. Again, you have some of this happening in the Bitcoin mining space, but what we've seen is it's very difficult to to custody a lot of ASICs, run one of these run one of these companies, and uh, be successful and do it across multiple cycles. Whereas when you're just staking ETH, you're really just sitting on your hands; you don't need to do anything um, once you've staked it. So this means you can expect more and more centralization among these ETH staking pools, that means censorship will increase. And this is why proof of stake is such a bad idea if you want your money to be neutral and censorship resistant. Now, what about Bitcoin censorship at the protocol level? It's much less of a concern, as I said, since Bitcoin mining is so competitive, unlike ETH staking. Yesterday's large Bitcoin mining companies are not today's or tomorrow's large Bitcoin mining companies. We talked about Core Scientific. And again, we're only worried about large mining companies that actually custody 
their Bitcoin mining machines. We're not worried about Bitcoin mining pool centralization since the Bitcoin mining pools do not custody the ASICs, the Bitcoin mining machines. And it's very, very trivial and easy to switch pools. Now, what happens if, if all the Bitcoin miners keep refusing to include my transaction in their next block? In other words, if they're trying to censor my transaction, what I can do is I can keep raising the transaction fee attached to it until someone takes it. As transaction fees go up, it can suddenly become profitable for some miners, for some ASICs who are unprofitable at a lower fee level to come back on the network, start mining again, take my transaction and include it in a block. So individual Bitcoin miners may come and go, Bitcoin mining companies may come and go, but Bitcoin mining itself is robust and anti-fragile simply because of this transaction fee market that will adjust to any conditions, including an empty block attack. Now, obviously you can have transaction fee market adjustments with Ethereum, but what are you gonna do when you have all those concentrated staking pools and they stay, you have the same staking pools year after year cycle, after cycle. So that's the, the key difference, that sort of centralization. And if you have a lot of centralization, it doesn't matter how high the fees go in Ethereum, simply because those miners will not, uh, I'm sorry, those validators will not break US law and risk losing their licenses to include a transaction. So they will not be tempted by mining fees in the same way that you or I might be tempted by a large transaction fee uh, using our Bitcoin miner in our basement. Now what's an empty block attack? That's where a miner or a group of miners controls a lot of the hash rate, at least 51%, and decides to mine blocks that don't include any transactions. We've talked about this before, I believe, but what happens then is the mempool, the waiting pool for transactions. It fills up with unconfirmed transactions. Frustrated transactors keep raising their transaction fees in order to get their transaction through. And then at some point, Bitcoin miners, when you have all these high transaction fee transactions, potential transactions sitting in the mempool, Bitcoin miners see this and say, oh, wow, I could be earning 10 Bitcoin or more just from these high transaction fees if I batch them up, not including that 6.25 Bitcoin block subsidy, which is, uh, which is something different. So miners get the block subsidy, subsidy, then they get the transaction fees. And when transaction fees get high, it can become very profitable to mine, even for old Bitcoin mining machines. And so this is how the market develops. Conclusion, if you want freedom money, you cannot have transactions being censored at the protocol level, i.e. not being included in blocks. Proof of stake trends towards more and more centralization. Large centralized validators will always be regulated in the US and other, company, and other countries due to their size. Therefore, all proof of stake systems will trend towards regulatory capture. And Ethereum's already at 60, 67%. It's already quite high. I don't think it'll take too much time before that, that trends very close towards 100%. So this is why hodling Ethereum, especially if you have a sort of cypherpunk mentality, it makes zero sense because in a world of CBDC, central bank digital currencies, there's gonna be another captured coin that will take the market share from Ethereum. It's gonna be FedCoin. And so you're not gonna need another captured controlled coin like Vitalik coin. What you're gonna need is freedom money where it has this really robust anti-fragile market where other Bitcoin miners can come in and be tempted by the fees and take your money. And uh, I'm sorry, take your transaction and put it in their block. And they won't be stopped by the US government because it's just a machine sitting in someone's basement. And this would be very, very difficult to enforce. Or maybe it's someone, someone's basement in another country. US government's not gonna be able to reach its hands all the way into China or Russia or Iran and tell someone in their basement that they cannot include a certain transaction in a block. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.